going to look at Solomon tonight, and he's our first king. Uh, if you weren't here last week, we introduced the subject of the good kings of Judah. It would be a, I'd love to have a little summary moment, but I, I don't want to spend the time talking about the past. But there are eight of Judah's kings, of which it says, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And so we're focusing on those eight. And we learned last week that all eight of these kings, though the Bible says they did what was right, they ended badly. Every one of them. And we learned that each of these kings has a different flaw, a character flaw. And uh, so we're going to focus on those flaws. Solomon's is one of the easiest to spot. I mean, you don't have to have a PhD in theology to figure out his problem. Uh, it's pretty obvious. Let me start a lot of stories. Anybody ever been to the Saratoga battlefield in New York? Saratoga, New York. A few, okay. Saratoga was about, 20 mi about an hour from where we live. It was the turning point of the American Revol Revolution. Uh, the battle there. Well, it's a beautiful battlefield. They've uh, arranged that you drive through it and see the fields where the, fights, the fighting took place. And there's monuments. And there's a monument on Saratoga Battlefield today that's just a boot. So it's strange. It's just a boot. And you have to do a little research to find out what's the boot <coughs> about. And so let me tell you the story. This relates. This is, I'm not digressing. This relates very much to Solomon. The boot is commemorating a general, I think he was a general, who was wounded in the leg at the Battle of Saratoga. And he was a hero. In fact, he was wounded in leading the charge, or at least one of the charges, that turned the battle. He was a mega hero. That, and if that battle had gone the other way, the revolution might have gone the other way, theoretically. He was a hero of that battle, and he took a bullet in the leg, and so there's a monument to that. You might wonder, well, why don't we have the rest of his body on that monument, or why don't we even have his name? And let me tell you why. Because he was named General Benedict Arnold. And when you know the rest of the story, the greatest traitor in American history, but at that battle, he was a hero. And in the way my mind works, I wonder if somewhere in eternity, if Benedict Arnold is not saying, you know, if that bullet had just been about 24 inches up and I had died in that battle, things would have been very different. And I would be a hero for people like politically, governmentally. But... I outlived my faithfulness. Now that's a great introduction to Solomon and all of the kings. And I want to, one of the prayers I find myself praying these days is, Lord, don't let me live too long. <laughs> don't let me live to the point where I bring disgrace to your name. And that's Solomon. And we're going to read the text that says, When he was old, his wives turned his heart. If only he had died young. If only he, I don't know what to do with that, except just to share the information with you. Solomon, let's... Um, I'm debating on where to start. Let's start in Deuteronomy chapter 17. And I'll tell you why in a moment. <coughs> Moses included in the law a section that every king was supposed to read yearly. So this was supposed to be a part of every king of Israel's repertoire. He knew this passage. In fact, he was supposed to write it out for himself. And this passage, it's like Solomon didn't you know this passage. It, you, let me just read it, okay? And this may not make sense till the end of the study, but I want to start here so you've got it. It's Deuteronomy 17, beginning at verse 14. Are you following there? And like I say, not everything I share with you is in the book. All right? So just, uh, it, it all fits. Chapter 17, verse 14. When 
saying, Moses is talking. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose, one from among your brothers who shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Now verse 16. Pay attention. <coughs> Only he must not acquire many what? Horses. Horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt to acquire horses. Egypt was famous for horses, sort of like Kentucky. Just If you want a good horse, go to Egypt. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Verse 17. And he shall not acquire many wives, wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver or gold. Now if you know Solomon's story, it's like one, two, three. Come on, Solomon. You're a wise man. And listen to the next verse. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a copy, in a book, a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life. In other words, one of the assignments of the king was to take the book of Deuteronomy and copy it for himself. Make a handwritten copy, just so you're sure you get it. That included this passage. So I picture Solomon at some point, you know, writing out, you shall not acquire many horses, you shall not acquire many wives, you shall not acquire excessive gold and silver. What do you do with this? Now that's the background. Let's turn now to second, uh, yeah, second Chronicles. We've got to dive right in. I'm skipping some fun stuff. Second Chronicles, chapter 1. My goal in studying the kings is to briefly look at all their good qualities. And uh, they have good qualities. And they're very interesting studies. But that's not our interest. Our interest is the flaw, the chink in the armor, the leak in the boat, the fly <coughs> in the ointment. I asked last week, last week, how many leaks in a boat does it take to sink a ship? You know, unfortunately, just one. And how many flaws in a character does it take to cast a shadow over a person's entire life. It's just the way it is. So let's look, look, look at Solomon's uh, strong points. And now if you're following in your book, we're skipping Roman numeral one because that's basically what we did last week. I reorganized that. So we're down at number two where it says more, more, more. All right? Um, let's start in chapter one. I'm just going to read a little bit. Uh, Verse 7, chapter 1, verse 7. I'm not going to give all the context. But that night God appeared to Solomon and said, Ask what I shall give you. This is a little bit like the story of Aladdin's lamp. You know, you get, you get one wish. Be careful what you ask for. But a God, what, what would you ask? This is this young king. And Solomon said to God, You've shown great and steadfast love to David, my father. You've made me king in his place. O Lord God, let your word to David, my father, be now fulfilled, for you've made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before this people. For who can govern this people of yours, which is so great? Lord, I'm not up to this task. Give me, give me wisdom. What a great answer. You know, what a, and, and Scripture is very strong in affirming. What a great request. And God goes on to say, because you've asked for wisdom, and because you didn't ask for riches and possessions and honor, I'm going to give you riches and possessions and honor because you've asked for the right thing. And this is one of the drama, one of the ironies of Solomon's life, is how can a man so wise end up making such stupid choices. That's a, that's a big one. And I'm not certain I have the answer to that. So I'm not the answer man on this. I, 
sort of like Will Rogers reading the newspaper. You know, I just read it, I don't explain it. <laughs> it's in the book. It's a part of the revealed will of God that he wants us to just absorb. Look down at verse 14. And you'll, you'll remember the Deuteronomy passage. Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. Oops. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he stationed in chariot cities with the king in Jerusalem. And the king made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stone. And he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore of the Shephelah. And Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt. And the king's traders would buy them from Kuwait for a price. They imported a chariot from Egypt for 60 shekels and a horse for 150. Okay, so that gives you a little hint that Solomon, are you supposed to do that? Um, so, number one there, off to a great start, give me now wisdom and knowledge, he asks for. In the chapters that follow, Solomon builds the temple. And it's a great study on management, on organization, administration, worship. I mean, Solomon was a very gifted young man. And um, the fire came down and filled the temple. The glory of the Lord filled the temple. Chapter 7, verse uh, 1. Chapter 7, verse 14, where God, after the, ded at the dedication, says to Solomon, If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, turn from their sins and seek my face. I'll hear their prayer, I'll forgive their sin, I'll heal their land. That was Solomon, to whom that wonderful promise was given in chapter 7, 14. Um, if you're in chapter 7, look at verse 17. God is speaking to the king. And as for you, Solomon... If you walk before me as David, your father, walked, doing according to all that I've commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I'll establish your royal throne. Verse 19. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments I've set before you and go and serve other gods, I will pluck you up from my land that I've given you and this house that I have consecrated for in my name I will cast out of my sight. So there's a very clear warning. If you, do, if you keep your heart like your daddy's heart, blessing upon blessing will come. If you turn aside, I will even take this temple and cast it aside. Chapter, um, yeah, verse number three there, a promise and a warning. As for you, if you walk before me as David walked, And then in, um, oh, look at chapter 8, verse 11. Solomon brought Pharaoh's daughter from the, from the city of David to the house that he had built. So Solomon, king of Judah, married the daughter of the king of Egypt. Politically, that was a genius. Theologically, that's like the equivalent of swallowing poison. <laughs> it's a... Uh, like, Solomon, you're bringing her into the royal line, the lineage of David, Pharaoh's daughter? You know, what, what, we just have, these are hints of a, maybe there's something rotten in Denmark. Or, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, chapter 9 is the story of the Queen of Sheba. And Jesus loved this story. And uh, most people think she came from what today is Ethiopia. Uh, it's interesting that in Ethiopia, I've, I've visited there, but they talk about Sheba. And they believe she went to, uh, yeah, Dustin, you've lived in Egypt, you know all these stories, and I, you ought to be teaching this. Um, but uh, she went, she heard about the wisdom of Solomon, and went from Ethiopia, or Cush, or Put, those are the Old Testament names for some of those upper Nile regions, and uh, the Ethiopians believe that she and Solomon had a son together. And that lineage went all the way through Haile Selassie, who lived in the 20th century. Yeah, all you Kenyans. Yeah, this, Africans know these stories. It's very interesting history. Do you know the Ethiopians think they have the Ark, Ark of the Covenant yeah. in Ethiopia? 
this is a, okay. Uh, that's for another day. All right. Turn to uh, chapter 9, verse 13. And we're going to dive into the flaw here. We're doing good. But I want you to just read a little bit about the well. Chapter 9, verse 13. Now the weight of the gold that came to Solomon in one year was how many talents of gold? Six, six, six. I have no idea what to do with that. But it doesn't sound good. It feels ominous. And I'm not one to be too quick to read into numbers. A lot of people love that sort of stuff. But uh, that's sort of hard to miss. 666 talents of gold. It's like that just jumps out. Um, look at verse 17. The king also made a great ivory throne. It's so beautiful they just had to talk about it. And they overlaid it with pure gold. The throne had six steps, and the footstool was of gold, which were attached to the throne. And on each side of the seat were armrests and two lions standing beside the armrests. While twelve lions stood there, one on each side, on each end of the steps, of the six steps, nothing like it had ever been made for any kingdom. I mean, what a throne that was. When we lived in France, we used to love to visit Chateau. And Fontainebleau had a throne room where Napoleon sat. And of course, Napoleon was a short little fellow. His throne was pretty small. But it was, you know, you just want to watch it. You go in there, just to, it's like, wow, this a throne room. And Solomon had one like nobody else. Um, silver, verse 20, was not considered as anything in the days of, oh, that's just silver. It's like a tin. Because the king's ships went to Tarshish with the servants of Hiram. Once every three years, the ships of Tarshish used to come bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. Just uh, so interesting. Then king, thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom, and all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom. Every one of them brought his present articles of silver and gold and garments and myrrh and spices and horses and mules so much year by year. And Solomon had 4,000 stalls of horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen who were stationed in chariot cities. And he ruled over the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines, to the border of Egypt. And the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stone. And horses were imported for Solomon from Egypt and from all the lands. And according to 2 Chronicles, he dies. But to get his flaw, and we're just going to go there, 1 Kings chapter 11. And this is where it gets interesting. And this is where we're going to camp. Okay? And when you know the first part of the story, this story, this part of the story just makes you want to weep. It's like, what happened? I'm in 1 Kings 11. Are you there? Here we go. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women. Several words jump out there. Many, foreign, along with the daughter of Pharaoh. We already saw Pharaoh's daughter that he married. So he loved Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, because they will surely... Turn your heart away after their gods. It's hard to be more clear. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 <coughs> wives. Like, I want to say, if you're so wise. <laughs> anyway. And 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. Because when Solomon was old, this is why I told the boot story. He lived too long. I don't know how else to say it. In the fourth quarter of the game, 
He had played a very good game for three quarters. But in the fourth quarter, his wives turned away his heart after other guard, uh, gods, and his heart was not, there's that word, wholly committed. Remember last week, the eyes of the Lord searched throughout the whole earth that he might show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts is completely, totally, wholly God's. Well, Solomon didn't have a heart like that anymore because of his wives, as was the heart of his daddy, David. Verse 5, because Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. This is the guy who built the temple. He's worshiping these foreign gods. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Moloch, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all of his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Okay, let's try to... Uh, I'm at the top of the page two here. We've seen his character strengths. His prayer for... The blanks are his prayer for wisdom his lavish and passionate worship, his gift of administration. Those would each be fun to talk about, but we're not going to talk about it. Let's talk about the flaws. We just read it. How do you explain what happened to Solomon? You see A, B, C, and D there? Let me give you some hypothetical explanations. You know, when we try to explain sin, I always think of the answer that supposedly Napoleon gave when somebody asked him, why did you invade Russia? <laughs> and supposedly he said, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> I think that's what sinners typically say. Why did you do such a stupid thing? And I think sinners look back on the insanity of our choices. And we say, I have no idea. At the time, it seemed to make sense, but obviously. Here, here's some of my hypotheticals. Perhaps, how do you explain it? Perhaps his parents were to blame. That's always fun. Who was mom and dad for Solomon? David, David and Bathsheba. Bathsheba Gate. <laughs> Remember Bathsheba. He was not, he was born after they were married. But he knew his mom and dad were the result of an affair. He had to know that story. So maybe you could say, poor Solomon, like father, like son. Maybe, perhaps, B, perhaps these marriages were part of his foreign policy. <laughs> I mean, this was genius, politically. To marry Pharaoh's daughter was a coup. Can you imagine, I try to think today, can you imagine if one of Obama's daughters married Assad's son? Something like that. It's like, that would get everybody's attention. It's like, wow, that maybe will have peace? I don't know. It's, politically, it's interesting. Or C, maybe he was bored. Wealthy people often are bored. They got everything. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity, I've got all the culture, all the music, all the arts, all the gold, all the power. I'm so bored. Maybe I'll visit my harem. You know, that's... Rich people think like that. Uh, not just rich, by the way. D, Perhaps he had an addiction. This is genetics. He was wired this way. Now these are all sort of tongue-in-cheek. But how do you explain Solomon, who knew the law, who loved God at the beginning, 
with all of his heart, I think, and yet drank poison. Just let's talk a little bit about um, victory over sexual temptation because this um, is just jumping out at us. You know, I used to think when I was in college, by the time I get 59, <laughs> I won't struggle with sexual temptation anymore. You know, you grow out of this stuff, don't you? And, uh, you know, it, no, you don't. It's still there. And it was for Solomon. It's, uh, it's something we all need to hear. You may not struggle with sexual temptation, but people in churches out west struggle with this stuff. So we can, uh, we can pray for them. Good, I'm glad you asked it that. Here's just four, you've heard this a hundred times, but one, be alert. Be alert. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. If you think you're immune to this one, it just shows how, immune, how vulnerable you really are. If the strongest man in the world can have a sexual moral failure, Samson, if the wisest man in the world, Solomon, can have a sexual moral failure, if the godliest man in the world, David, can fall in this area, you really think you're immune? <laughs> I really think I'm immune, so be alert. Be alert. Shields up. That's the Star Wars vocabulary. Shields up. <laughs> Number two, be severe. Ephesians 5.3 says, let there not be even a hint of sexual immorality among you. It's an interesting statement. In other words, I think he was talking to people who said, I know you're not probably going to get involved in this stuff, but don't even let there be a hint. I know, uh, not that we did it right, but when I was the pastor at Loudonville, we built a new building, and in our office building, I insisted that there be windows in every office door, just so that you can see in. It's just a, a hint of, of a reminder that we want transparency. Um, don't, don't let there be a hint. Be, so be severe. Number three, I just wrote it this way, be gone. In other words, run, flee. With nearly every temptation in the Bible, the Bible says, be strong, stand, fight. When it comes to sexual temptation, the Bible says, turn on your heel and run as fast and quickly as you can. That's what Paul told Timothy. Flee sexual temptation. Don't stand there to prove how godly you are. Get out of the room. Get, get away. Flee. Run. And I like the fourth one. Fight fire with fire. Because lust is a fire. And to fight one fire the forest fighters teach us they often burn, they fight fire with fire. They burn in front of the fire so that the fire doesn't have anything to consume. So fight fire with fire. So to fight lust, the Bible would say you've got to find a fire that burns hotter than lust. And let me tell you, there's only one that I know of that's hotter than lust. And that is Pentecost. The fire of Pentecost. The fire of the Holy Spirit. Uh, anybody know who Thomas Chalmers is? Does that name mean anything to you? Thomas Chalmers was a Scottish Presbyterian in the 1800s, I think. And his most famous sermon, according to my understanding, I got it off the internet, actually. It's pretty hard to read. Presbyterians are pretty serious theologians, but it's good stuff. But the name of the sermon is The Expulsive Power of of a new affection. And the title is worth the sermon. If you got the title, you got you understand what he's saying. His text is, Love not the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And he's saying the only way to fight love of the world is to find something you love more passionately than the world. And it's like, well, 
Well, I love the world passionately. So what's more passionate? And he said, God. The expulsive power of a new affection. I have two quick illustrations. Uh, when I was in college, uh, here in Johnson Main Dorm, back <coughs> here in the Dark Ages, I had a little hot pot for my room. I thought this was super cool to be able to make your own coffee in your room. And it was, uh, it just boiled water and I had instant coffee. You know, that was sort of state of the art. I could make my own coffee in my room. That was, uh, today that's. But so I, for, there was a season in my life I loved instant coffee. And I'll fast forward this, but one day I met a place called Starbucks. <laughs> And once you've tasted Starbucks, you can't go back to that instant. Amen. I got it. <laughs> That's the expulsive power of a new affection. I've never had instant coffee since, except when I go to Africa. They drink a lot of instant coffee in Africa. But uh, let me tell you another, a better story. Do you know in Greek mythology, the island, do you remember the island of the sirens? Mm -hmm. Uh, the, and incidentally, Starbucks, do you know what their logo is? Look on their cup, and there's a woman with long hair covering up certain parts of her body, uh, appropriately so, but she's a siren. And what their logo says is, come to me, come to me. You walk past, you see our logo, and suddenly you say, man, I'd love a cup of coffee. It's a siren, it's, a, it's an enchantress, it's a voice. Well, in Greek mythology, the question was, how do you get past the island of the sirens? Because they lure you toward them, these beautiful seductive mermaids or women singing and chanting, sitting on the rocks, and then the ships crash and everybody drowns. So how do you get past them? Well, Ulysses, on his way home, had to get past him. Remember, and this is the story that most of us remember. Remember how he got past him? He said, tell you what, gentlemen, I want you to tie me to the mast. I want to hear him. But I want you to all put wax in your ears, and that's how we're going to get past. So you got this picture of will, human willpower, just by sheer restraint. I really want to go, but I can't go. You know, okay. That's called victory over temptation according to Ulysses. That's one, and many people try to fight sexual temptation that way. Just willpower. Just tie me to the mast. You know, just Operation Bootstrap. Jason and the Argonauts went by this same island. Anybody know how, I had to do some research on this, because I'm not real strong in mythology. We've got some English majors here. But Jason said, no, we're not going to do it that way. When we pass this island, we have Orpheus on board, the greatest musician in Greece. And he has his golden harp. And Orpheus, you come up on deck, and the sweet music of Orpheus is going to drown out those seductive voices. And they got by. Not out of willpower, because it's like, who wants to go to those voices <coughs> when Orpheus is playing the sweet music? The, the expulsive power of a new affection. That's what I think the Bible is calling us to when it comes to sexual temptation. That you've got to find something you love with a hotter passion, with greater intensity, and the options are very limited. Only God and the fire of Pentecost can equal those enchanted voices. Are you, following, are you following that? Um, Google that Thomas Chalmers and get to know this sermon, the, the expulsive power of a new affection. I don't think he was a holiness kind of guy, but he certainly believed in purity. He was Presbyterian. And th that's, but this is not bad. If I love God more than I love the world and the things in the world, that's what, with my whole heart. Okay, um... We've already read Deuteronomy 17 about the horses, the gold, and the women. And I've asked the question again here, how to explain Solomon's 
Solomon's flagrant disobedience. And here are just some more attempts, because I can identify with all of them. Perhaps he justified his behavior as an act of political expediency. Or maybe he felt he was above the law. Why do I have to obey Deuteronomy? I'm the king. The king in Babylon, the king in Egypt, doesn't have to obey the law. You know, when the founders put together America, they were very clear that the president is under the law. You're not over the law. And even lawmakers are under law. And you say, where'd they get that idea? The Old Testament, where they got that idea. Uh, or see, perhaps he found a way to justify his behavior. It's only a little compromise. Um, maybe he felt these activities would make him a more effective witness. <laughs> maybe I can win Pharaoh if I marry his daughter. And let me tell you, I know that thought process. I know how that mindset works. I've been there. And before you know it, you make some stupid decision. I used to, uh, in Loudonville, tell the people, you know, if I could just drive a Porsche, I could reach the upper crust in Albany. I could witness better to them. And everybody responded exactly like you did, right, Pastor said. We're not going to buy you a Porsche. And, uh, and I was joking, because it's, that's not how witness works. But we begin to think that way when our heart's not pure. Or maybe he felt he was immune. And I suspect that me. Have a moral failure. I don't do moral failures. And before you know it. Okay, let's try to wrap this up. This is uh, how I'm defining, and you're free to disagree with my attempt to name these flaws, but I'm at number three there, Solomon's flaw. What then shall we call Solomon's basic fatal flaw? I've chosen to call it lust. And synonyms for that might be, or similar words, greed, desire, avarice, cupidity, veracity, covetousness, insatiable appetites. But it wasn't just lust for women. As we've seen, it's lust, and these are some blanks. Lust for money, lust for power, lust for fame, for knowledge, Lust for culture, the arts. Solomon loved the arts. Lust for reputation. Solomon was never content. He never had enough. He always wanted more. If I just had a few more wives in my harem, if I just had a few more gold in my treasury, if I just had a few more horses in my stables, then... I'd be happy. No wonder he wrote the book Ecclesi Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity, vanity. Some people have called this um, lust, insatiable lust for more. I forget where I first heard this. Destination disease. It's a disease that when you have it, you always think, I'll be happy when I get there. It's never here. And let me tell you, I know when I first contracted destination disease. It was in the first grade. And let me tell you my story. Because when I was in the first grade, I remember this. One day I looked down the hall and I saw fourth graders. And they were huge. And they were super cool. And I began to say in first grade, when I get to fourth grade, that's where life is. When I get there. Well, I got there. But you know what I learned in the fourth grade? Ah, it's middle school. That's where life happens. I mean, those guys. Well, I got to middle school. And you'll never guess what happened. Nope, not here. It's high school. That's cool. And I began to live not for where I was, but for where the destination was. I got to high school. Nope, it's college. I leave home. Freedom. Go to college. I got in college. Here in Wilmore, actually. And I began to think, 
No, it's when you get married. That's when life happens. So I got married. Wasn't long into marriage, we began to say, no, it's when you have children. And at some point in this, you begin to catch on with the insanity of this. I think, uh, we, well, we had children. And then after a few years of children, we began to say, no, it's when the children leave. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was when I began to say, no, it's retirement. <laughs> that it was like the Holy Spirit grabbed me by the neck and said, Stan, you're going to miss all of life by living for destination. That's Solomon. He never had enough. He always wanted more. And he died writing the book of Ecclesiastes. I got it all! I got what I gave my life to. And it's an empty shell. It's an empty shell. The only cure for the destination disease is comes. What did you say? Did you say grandchildren? <laughs> I'm not touching that with a 10 foot pole. Uh, Philippians 4. Paul, sitting in Nero's prison, waiting execution. Probably execution. He may not have been executed that time. But he's, and prisons are not, when you think Roman prisons, don't think American prison system. Sanitized, video, games, color television, three square meals a day. Don't think that. Think rat-infested, damp, dirty, smelly dungeons. And Paul, sitting in Nero's prison, says, I learned the secret. I can be content wherever I am. When I abound, when I'm abased. When I'm full, when I'm hungry, I can be content sitting right here in Pharaoh's presence. Our Bible study this morning, Danny Carpet, a little bird in I that Madame Guillaume wrote in the Bastille, cut off. Oh, I should have brought it. It's a beautiful poem. Madame Guillaume said, I'm not Louis XIV's prisoner. I can sing for the one who placed me here. And it wasn't Louis XIV, it was God. It's a, a little bird, and I, I, I'm sorry I didn't bring that for you. Um, we're going to stop there. I was going to, you know, we've got some table talk times. And uh, as we go through these kings, tonight we had some time together to prayer, to form groups. But I'm going to periodically ask you to uh, respond to these lessons and to try to, try to uh, apply it in your own life. But I think I want to ask anybody here struggling with the destination disease. It's a killer. And it did a number on Solomon. He never <coughs> had enough. Jesus told a parable about the rich fool. And Jesus said, don't call anybody a fool. But he called this man in his parable a fool. He's like, I love the Bible. And he said he's a fool because he kept thinking if I get bigger barns, more barns, then I'll be happy. Jesus said, you're a fool. Tonight, your soul is required. Have you found contentment today? Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for just a wonderful evening to spend with brothers and sisters, to share with Megan and Destin, to be reminded of people in, who are in tragic circumstances tonight. And thank you for the chance to study this king, who was a great king in so many ways. But Lord, in the fourth quarter of the game, when he was old, his heart became divided. And he just wanted more of everything. And he fell for the lie that if I just have more, then I'll be content. Lord, thank you for the words of Paul tonight, where Paul said, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every circumstance. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, I want to dare to pray tonight for some of us who have been bitten by that disease of when I get 
there, that's when I'll find happiness or joy or contentment. Lord, would you help us realize that today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Give us that sweet secret, the open secret of contentment right now where we are. Protect us from this lust for more that just consumes a good man. Protect us and heal us. And fill us with that passion that comes from the fire of your spirit that protects us from every other seductive voice. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, for the sake of the kingdom. Amen. See you next week. We're going to do King Asa next week.